Hello and welcome to the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation SISM Live Series, where we connect with critical incident stress management subject matter experts live on YouTube. My name is Kelly and I'm the host of the SISM Live Series. If you enjoy the content being shared today, please consider giving this video a like down below. Today we're actually joined by guest speaker Dr. George Everly, one of ICISF's co-founders, Dr. Everly is an award-winning author, researcher, and is considered one of the founding fathers of the field of disaster mental health. Dr. Everly has spent almost 40 years and traveled to over 25 countries lecturing on and researching the psychological aspects of disaster. Welcome, Dr. Everly. Well, thank you, Kelly. Good morning. Good morning. So today we'll be discussing resilient leadership. Uh, Dr. Everly, what is resilient leadership and how does this differ from traditional leadership? So I guess in order to best understand what resilient leadership is, we should back up and just understand what leadership is. So think of leadership. It's the ability to influence or guide others. Um, it's a force. It shapes social energy into a social force. And especially relevant for our conversation, it, it guides us in the fog of crisis. So I would argue that leadership next to religion is probably the most studied and written about subject in human history. You'd think writing about it for 3000 years, we would have fully understood it. We, we, there's nothing new to discover, if you will. So why do we keep pursuing it? Why is it such a prized possession, how to guide others? It's a glue, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, leadership is a glue that shapes a society from a crowd. And it, I mentioned that it was a force. It, it, it's a way of harnessing social energy when we think of it in not just societal ways, but other ways, we can think of it as a force that keeps a team and organization from just being a chaotic, uncoordinated crowd. So it's kind of an important thing, Kelly, I think. Now, if that's leadership, what's crisis leadership? So that's a subset, isn't it? So crisis leadership is the ability to influence and guide others through the fog of crisis, through adversity. It focuses on getting from A to B and making the present better. So having set the stage, then what would we call resilient leadership? It's something else. So resilient leadership to me is the term that describes the leadership styles that resist or help people adapt to or rebound from crisis and adversity. So it's a little more than crisis leadership. Crisis leadership, we focus on the present, getting through the fog of crisis. Resilient leadership, is about getting through the fog of crisis, but rebounding, not back, but forward. Is it possible to use adversity and crisis as a way of getting better, as a way of growing, as, as a way of getting stronger? And I think that's what resilient leadership is really all about. Well, thank you for breaking all of those definitions down. I think that that helps clarify exactly what resilient leadership is. Uh, so what prompted you to develop this notion of resilient leadership? Well, I was actually teaching in Hong Kong and I was approached by the management of the Hong Kong Hospital Authority. And they asked for a leadership class. They had the World Trade Center meetings coming up and they had the Beijing Olympics coming up. So this was a while back. And, uh, I thought leadership is something that you learn in military academies. It's something that you learn in business school. Mm -hmm. and, and I was, I was reluctant 
and I, I, what I really said to them was, uh, I think this is something you want to get somebody from Harvard Business School to teach. Um, but they, uh, they were persistent. And I said, well, I'll teach it if we can take a slightly different tact. So I took the science of resilience and tried to combine it with the science of leadership. Initially, I thought, well, I'm not sure the two fit. But as evidence, I'm not the smartest guy around. They, they did fit. And I'm, I'm reminded, and you may remember as well, the Egyptian myth of the phoenix. That was the bird that's reborn from its own ashes. And while Herodotus, who was a, a Greek writer and philosopher, first really wrote about that, bringing that notion from Egypt into Greece, it was later a Greco-Roman who saw something else in the myth. It wasn't just the bird rising from its ashes to be reborn. It was actually the bird rising from the ashes and being stronger than it was before. And that caught my attention. If you stop and think about this, Kelly, you and, and think ahead a little bit, this is actually most likely the foundation for the formation of what we now call post-traumatic growth. Mm. So, so it's kind of an exciting thing. So we typically think about post-traumatic growth as something that one discovers for oneself through introspection and experience in the wake of adversity, in the wake of trauma. But is post-traumatic growth also something that could be fostered by a leader. What an exciting idea, if it's, if it's correct. Mm -hmm. so, so that was the impetus coming uh, along. Again, paying homage to George Santayana, who said those who fail to read history are condemned to repeat it. So, so go back and read history and find, well, wait a minute, this, this is not such a crazy idea after all. So, we find that history is replete with examples of people, of organizations, of societies who are able to not only navigate the fog of crisis, but to come out better, to do things that they wouldn't have done before. It seems to me that, that leadership in the best of times is challenging. Leadership in crisis is, is harder still and yet resilient leadership, which is a transformational leadership is, is truly unique, but perhaps the most prized of all. So speaking of resilient leadership and uh, individuals within history, can you provide examples of who stands out as exemplary resilient leaders? Well, it's kind of interesting. Um, I'm sure the world, world history has many, many, many examples. Um, my favorite is, is Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. who failed at just about everything he did periodically, but kept bouncing back, but not just bouncing back. He had a unique way of taking a failure personally and using it as an advantage to be more successful subsequently than the thing he was actually failing at. And the classic example is that he ran for vice president of the United States and failed and turned around and ran for president. Now who would do that and won? So you look at his personal life but then you take a look at his professional life, trying to keep a country together. In the early days of the American Civil War, there was failure after failure after failure. And yet he was insistent that even among efforts to seek a peace with the Confederate States, he was insistent that the Union must be preserved. And ultimately, of course, his, his efforts resulted in 
the greatest country on earth. I think also of Franklin Delano Roosevelt as, a, as an amazing, resilient crisis leader. Most people don't remember that it, when he took over the presidency, when he was elected president, he inherited a failing financial system. Mm. His predecessor, Herbert Hoover, uh, decided not to deal with it. He basically passed the buck. So the first thing that FDR had to do was deal with a, a system that was in collapse. So he did something that was amazing. He shut the entire financial system down to use a kind of a, a common parlance now or technical. He rebooted the entire financial system, took great courage. His famous line from his inaugural address was, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. He was not talking about World War II. He was talking about the state of financial disarray in the country. Mm. So he starts the system all over again. He reboots it, but that was not enough because for the next roughly six, seven years, he took the opportunity of crisis to build systems that would not only fix the problem, but make us stronger. For example, under the umbrella of what he called the New Deal, he created the social security system. He created assurances that crises as they would appear in the future would not have the adverse impact. He developed the Tennessee Valley Authority. He electrified rural America. He did things that most people don't think about as his legacy, but they were enduring. Most people think about him as the president during World War II. If that's all you see, you're missing what he really contributed. His legacy lives on and it made America far greater than it would have been without that financial crisis. But you can also think about COVID, the COVID pandemic of 2021, tragic, terrible, but this is also some, <clears throat> excuse me, something that possibly has the ability to make us better, to make us stronger, to take a look at our public health systems, to take a look at our vaccination policies. Some companies actually have made changes that they would not have made absent this crisis. One of the things I think about is, are we going to go back to work? Will working from home be not just the exception to the rule, but maybe the rule for, for many industries? It will change not just the way we work, but the way we live our lives, given far greater flexibility. So there are people, I think, who understand how important change can be and how and what an, I should say an opportunity crisis can be to make the changes perhaps you always wanted to make but but couldn't this may be one of those watershed ideas so resilient leadership is the ability to not only navigate crisis but to come out stronger and th this is what we want to teach leaders, because ultimately, the goal is to not just be an effective leader. It is to create a culture, an organizational culture of resilience. But it begins with the leader. So that actually leads perfectly into my next question. Uh, so what are the fundamentals then of resilient leadership? So that's a great question. So when we were playing with this idea, I was thinking, okay, maybe this is a slightly new take on this 3000 year old idea. Um, so what, <laughs> can, can we do something with it? Can we, can we teach it? 
Can we put it in a training program? If so, you have to be able to adapt. Is to go, go, go back, as Santayana said, and, and read history. So I, I read Sun Tzu. I read Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. I read von Clausewitz, his On War. And I even read Machiavelli, although he is much maligned. There, there are some things to be said about Machiavelli, I think. So I... I think these are not just leadership classics. I chose them, and there are many, many, many leadership classics, but I chose these because they were written either during times of great turmoil or for times of turmoil. They were written as guides for, for basic crisis leadership. But I wanted to see if there were commonalities. Now remember, Sun Tzu goes back to 300 BC. Homer goes back to 7, 800 BC. Von Clausewitz is the 1800s. Machiavelli is the 1600s. We're covering a lot of territory there. But were there some common themes? And I found some common themes. We then got some raw data on presidential effectiveness and presidential crisis leadership. And I think we can hold, the job of president of the United States has been called the most difficult job in the world. I think it can be used as a proxy for all types of leadership. So we then analyzed what makes an effective president, what makes an effective president under crisis conditions. We then had two huge sets of data, the presidential data, and we had the historical data. And then we combined them. And we said, through a distillation process, are there, are there common themes? And there were. First and foremost, having a positive vision seemed critical. Being able to make a decision was also very, very important. Have you ever worked for a person who couldn't make a decision? It makes you nuts. It just absolutely frustrates you, makes you angry. Mm -hmm. it's, it's demoralizing. So having a vision is not enough. You must act on that vision. But acting on that vision, the way you do it is important. And we found that following some form of moral compass was really important. A sense of honesty and integrity builds trust and, and trust builds affiliation. We also found that connection with others was important building supportive collaborative coalitions, relationships. And that is best done through open, honest, truthful, transparent, and timely communication. So those are our five elements. So as a crisis responder then, what would you recommend for individuals that are in leadership roles? Something that we sometimes forget. In fact, I'm not even sure we're taught. The golden age of leadership literature was the 1960s, at least in, in, in the Western hemisphere. And one thing that several authors agreed upon were there, there are always two interacting dynamics in any group of people, group, team, organization, society, community. One is the mission. What is the goal of the group? What, what do they need to get done? The second is the relationship, the people. So there's the, there's the work side and there's the people side. In military and paramilitary organizations, because of their rank structures, they are often focusing on the mission to the exclusion of the people side. The most successful leaders throughout history, other than the flash in the pans, the meteoric rise and tragic descents, the most successful leaders have been those that understand this duality and manage 
in a situational kind of way, emphasizing the task, the work, versus the people side. So for example, in routine situations, the work and the social people side are pretty much equally balanced at low intensity. You've kind of put it on autopilot. But then what happens when a crisis arises? All of a sudden the leader must shift their emphasis to mission while not eliminating, but relatively minimizing the people side. However, the longer the crisis lasts, and we've certainly seen that in, in the COVID, the longer the crisis lasts, the more important the reemergence of the people side. How do we get people compliant? That's a people question, not a mission question, believe it or not, and that's how people misinterpret it. Once we have quelled the crisis, we then, how do we, we ask the question, how do we deal with the aftermath? Let's analyze our successes, our failures, our lessons learned. Now we're shifting back to the mission. Finally, when policies and procedures are new and must be implemented as we will see, because COVID is a, is a prototype test case of this whole process. How do we make the transition to the new world, the post COVID world? That is not a mission question, it's a people question. We will fail miserably if we see this whole process with COVID-19 as a mission only issue. It is not. The problems again with vaccinations. We see that roughly 90% of all new cases are in unvaccinated people. Mm. That's a people problem, not a mission problem. It masquerades as a mission problem. So my, my admonition to new leaders is never lose track. There are always two processes that you need to manage. But if you manage them using the five principles of decisiveness, of a vision, and that vision can be a work in progress. I mean, FDR was pretty clear about that. He, he, he kind of made it up as he went along, but he still had a bigger vision if we communicate, if we have a moral compass, and if we appreciate the power of connectedness, we can, we can uh, not only navigate the crisis, we can come out far stronger than, than we were before, perhaps far stronger than we ever imagined we could be. Well, I certainly appreciate all of those helpful tips <laughs> for crisis responders out there with regard to being a resilient leader. Um, so if you've enjoyed our discussion today and would like to learn more about resilient leadership, you can actually register for our new live training and online course by Dr. George Everly, Resilient Leadership for Emergency Services and Healthcare Professions. This is offered as an asynchronous online course, meaning there is no instructor. Uh, this science-based online course is designed to aid you in building a personal culture of resilience and holistic health. We also offer this course as a live training, which includes content of traditional in-person classroom training via Zoom technology. You can get real-time presentation, faculty interaction, small breakout groups, and live question and answer sessions. To learn more and register for either the asynchronous online course or the live training, feel free to click the links in the description below. Dr. Everly also has a book in our SISM bookstore about resilient leadership called The Secrets of Resilient Leadership. This is a unique guide for leaders on how to create an organizational culture of resilience that can turn adversity into opportunity. To purchase your soft cover or online ebook, you can visit sismbookstore.com or click the link in the description below. I'd like to thank Dr. Everly for joining us today to learn more about resilient leadership for crisis responders. Thanks for having me, Kelly. Of course. And again, if you've enjoyed today's interview, make sure to give this video a thumbs up or leave a comment down below. Subscribe to ICISF YouTube channel to get notified for the next SISM Live series. <laughs> we'll see you all next time.